We turn now to Frank Gaffney. He is the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy, which means he plays a critical role in deciphering all of the gibberish that comes out of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar and the crazy things that are said by Democrats everywhere when it pertains to national security. And uh, we welcome him aboard right now. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. I'd like to think that I do other and more important things than that, but I'm happy to... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, we'll go uh, for a lot of us, I know. Yeah, well, and, you know, I'm, I'm, we all do more important things than deal with AOC, but but she tends to talk so much it, it requires a lot of our time to uh, to decipher through uh, the morass of what she says. But let's start with Ilhan Omar here. Uh, your reaction to this? She called. Uh, she was tweeting. Uh, yesterday about the uh, fire at, uh, at at Notre Dame, or this is actually on Monday, about the fire at Notre Dame, and said that uh, art and architecture have a unique ability to help us connect across our differences and bring people together in important ways, thinking of the people of Paris and praying for every first responder trying to save this wonder. She refers to the Notre Dame Cathedral, one of the the holiest and most historic sites in Western civilization, let alone Christianity, uh, as art and architecture. Your reaction to that? Well, I think for her, this would pass for a conciliatory gesture, a gesture of Hmm. um, trying to bring us all together after her myriad divisive, not to say anti-Semitic and hateful comments, But unfortunately, of course, it falls flat because what Notre Dame is, is one of the jewels of Christendom, a a, a holy place for Christians. And its destruction is a particular assault on, you know, Christianity, not just um, the, the, you know, history of art. And that's not to say that we know for sure that it was a deliberate attack that precipitated this, but I just have to say, Dylan, I'm struck by the fact that even before the fire was out, we were being told that it wasn't. And this is, of course, somewhat of a a default setting, it seems, for authorities on both sides of the pond. Um, You know, how many times have we seen a terrorist attack take place? and have the FBI rush out in this country and say, oh, it's not a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, oftentimes they have to backtrack as the facts come out. But my point is this, unless and until there is a proper investigation of the possibility of arson in Notre Dame that, that unfortunately fits a pattern of what has been happening in France and, for that matter, elsewhere in Europe, that most of us haven't a clue about. Did you know, for example, that on average, every day last year, there were two attacks on churches in France? On average. I did not know that. No. Some some of them were attacks involving fire. Some of them were simply desecrations of, you know, the organs or the the other art in in the churches. But this is going on, and it's not all accidents by any means. And the trouble is that I'm concerned that when the authorities, whether it's in France or whether it's elsewhere in Europe, whether it's here for that matter, tell us there's nothing to see here, folks. Move along. I'm afraid they're doing a couple of things. First of all, they're discrediting themselves, which is, I believe, not a good thing. As a former government guy myself, I don't like seeing our government discredited and, and cast into disrepute at its own hands. Mm-hmm. Oh, but they're also, I'm afraid, really reducing our, well, the military calls it situational awareness about the actual threats we face. And not only that, but I'm afraid in the process, they probably are emboldening enemies of, well, Western civilization, Christendom, freedom, this country, what have you. So these are the things that come to my mind when I hear um, uh, Representative Omar sort of Sterilely talking about this as just a, a, a serious loss of art and architecture. Uh, it's that 
to be sure, but it's so much more. And the fact that she won't acknowledge it uh, just, again, reinforces, I think, the right understanding of where she's coming from, which is, well, I think of it as Sharia supremacism. Uh, it mm-hmm. affects and influences a lot of what she's saying and, and what she's doing, unfortunately. Right, and I, and I agree with what you said uh, initially that this would this would pass for her taking a conciliatory tone. I think also what it shows here, just building off of what you said, is that because of of her makeup, just in terms of her philosophy and her outlook on life, she may well be impossible of accepting a genuinely conciliatory tone <laughs> when it comes yeah. to when it comes to Christianity. And we know she's incapable of a, of, of a conciliatory tone when, when it comes to dealing with terrorism and who the victims of terrorism are, as we saw with her 9-11 comments, because she's just a radical. She's an, abs- she's an absolute radical. This is who she is. She's incapable of being conciliatory because she's not conciliatory to anybody. Uh, she's not conciliatory towards Christianity. No, I mean, she's not conciliatory to people who are opposed to terrorism or people who have been the victims of terrorism. She is, she's, she's put it out there. Absolutely who she is. And, 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 and we're all seeing that. And I think it's going to hurt Democrats in 2020. Maybe it's not going to hurt her because her district is obviously what it is, but, but nationally, the more, the more spotlight she gets, I don't think it's a good thing. Thing, and I think that's why Nancy Pelosi is pushing back on on Omar and AOC right now and, and, and things of that nature uh, and people of that nature. Speaking of, of AOC, uh, she made some comments here recently uh, in, in, a, in a recent interview saying that cutting U.S. military aid to Israel is, quote unquote, certainly on the table. After the re-election of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Frank, what table is she eating off of, and how can I make sure that I never end up there? The table, of course, is one that she gets to sit at because uh, the people in her district in Brooklyn, I think, decided that they wanted her at the table. And whether she has much influence over what's actually served or what's done at the table or whatever extension of her metaphor you want to have. Uh, This is, unfortunately, I'm afraid, um, now a facet of thinking and and perhaps policy making within the Democratic Party. And I I worked for a great Democratic senator a lifetime ago by the name of Scoop Jackson. Mm -hmm. And Scoop Jackson um, has to be spinning at a very high RPM in his grave, (laughs) what has become of his party, because there were few people in America who more uh, clearly understood the importance of Israel to our security, not not just, you know, the need for us to be committed to it, but the value of Israel as a bulwark for freedom and, and our interests and our values in a very dangerous part of the world. And his like is no longer welcome in the Democratic Party. I mean, there are, there are a few of them who, you know, Elliot Engel comes to mind, who will still talk the talk a bit. But, but now the, the Democratic Party, and the reason that we've seen this kid glove treatment of AOC, and they you say Nancy Pelosi is pushing back, well, not so much. You know, honestly, um, they're having their way. Ilan Omar, uh, Rashida Tlaib, you know, these are people who are now driving the Democratic Party's rising hostility to Israel, um, to Jews, um, its uh, embrace of anti-Semitism. Now, these are sweeping generalizations, and I, I know there are Democrats both in Congress and elsewhere who don't appreciate this, uh, you know, trend, don't like it, don't really want to be associated with it, but they're not doing much to stop it, is the point. They're not well, reviling and I, it, and they're certainly yeah. not disassociating themselves as they should from it. Well, and, and Frank, isn't it also true that they're powerless to stop it in some certain respects? Because the, the, the base of the Democrat Party, which is overwhelmingly young and overwhelmingly dumb and very anti-Israel, uh, in, 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 in so, in so many ways, the AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Taleb, these, these kinds of politicians are, are, are the darlings and the rock stars of that group of people. 
who are inside their party. And that's a very dominant wing. That's the future of their party. Many would argue it's the present of their party. I mean, really, you know, and, and Nancy Pelosi made that comment the other day when she's, she's on 60 Minutes, I believe it was, so, you know, saying that, you know, the AOCs of the world, well, that's only five people in our whole party who are that extreme or they're that, you know, out, outlandish. But it, it, in reality, it may only be five people, but at the end of the day, those five people are the spokesmen for the future of her party, and she's not really able to stop it because they have that kind of power. Phil, and this is such an important point. But let me just add to the concern here. It is the future of America mm. because it's not just kids who happen to, you know, turn up as uh, democratic socialists or enthralled with those who are in Congress. It's it's a generation or two now of Americans who have been indoctrinated, uh, many of them in public schools, many of them government schools, if you will, many of them in private schools at very great expense to their parents, to believe that this kind of behavior, this kind of policy view is not only acceptable, but it is, you know, their own uh, view as well. And this is this is the trouble. We've we've watched the success just as a microcosm. You know, this is this is the cultural Marxists march through the institutions on display. But just in microcosm, if you look no further than what the so-called boycott divestment sanction movement (BDS) has done to help morph American Mm. youth from being, as generation upon generation of us have been, favorably disposed towards Israel. Again, believing that we have a moral uh, kindred spirit there as well as a strategic partner, that's now being replaced because of this indoctrination over decades to believe that, oh, no, it's an apartheid state. It's, it's horrible to the Palestinians. It has to be punished. It, if we can help the Palestinians drive the Jews into the sea, as they say, so that there are no Jews between the River Jordan and the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that is what is increasingly, I'm afraid now, a hallmark not just of the, the radical left that is clearly an ascendancy in the Democratic Party, but um, at least is being accepted as a legitimate kind of view by an awful lot of other young people, um, some of whom may vote Republican, probably fewer and fewer will over time, unless we work to sort of regain common sense and a Mm -hmm. more sensible, specifically, pro-American attitude among them. Couldn't agree more. Frank Gaffney, he's the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy. Excellent stuff this morning, Frank. So good to talk to you. Great to talk with you, Dylan. Thank you.